Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started. I'm going to take off my glasses so I can read. Um, my name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I am the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Public Policy Institute of California, otherwise known as PPIC. And thank you for joining us today here at the Capitol Events Center. For those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit with offices in San Francisco and Sacramento. We have a large contingent of our San Francisco group here today, so welcome. Um, we're glad to see you. Our program today is a college eligibility for University of California study. And to kick things off, we'll hear from New Gao, a researcher of ours uh, at PPIC, on a new report called New Eligibility Rules for the University of California, the Effects of the New Sci Science Requirements. Um, we have a new green deal here at PPIC, so you didn't get um, the, the report on your chairs, but we do have some in the back if you're interested. Additionally, the full report and technical appendixes, as well as the slides, are available now at the uh, ppic.org website. We're very grateful to the Sutton Family Fund for their support of this research. Following the presentation, Julian La Fortune, another one of our researchers, is going to moderate a broad discussion um, about how UC eligibility should be determined with a fantastic panel. And so we welcome you here. And uh, their bios are on the back. For, so for time's sake, we will um, we'll refer to those. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, PPIC's Han Johnson, who is here today. He's also a co-author of the report. You should have received an agenda um, at the desk, um, and on the back side is the bio. So in the interest of time, we'll only do brief introductions. However, please note that the, there's also an online audience. So when we do questions and answers, uh, please wait for the microphone um, before you um, ask your question. And a couple of things uh, before we begin, we will have a survey sent out to you via email. Uh, and we ask that you respond to that, uh, because we do take those surveys and adjust our program accordingly. And finally, please turn off your cell phones. California has some of the premier higher education institutions in the nation. And the demand for access to those schools is particularly high. Any changes in eligibility standards raises the concerns by families and, in some cases, advocates if those changes will reduce access to the systems. So in the last few years, when both segments began the process of changing eligibility standards, emotions ran particularly high. Um, if you watch the CSU board meeting, very high in some cases. <laughs> So today, we're going to hear from our researchers on a report PPIC did on the proposed UC eligibility standards. But it is clear that there is a larger debate around eligibility standards and the role they play in accessing our university system emerging. There are questions about, are those proposed eligibility standards at the core related to the skills and knowledge that students must obtain to be prepared for college and the workforce? How will they affect students' access and impact students, particularly disadvantaged students? Will the classes be available for the students to take? And will the parents and the students understand the new standards? I'd like to put a shout out to the UC system for providing us with data, because we were able to do this report because we got access to significant data and it was very helpful for us. Today, the debate has been happening at the academic senates and at the boards of both the CSU and UC system. But this issue is now emerging as an issue in the legislature, where at least one bill has been introduced to ask the, the segments to align eligibility standards. So it's a growing debate. So I'm hoping today's panel will help inform that debate. And so with that, I'd like to welcome my colleague and PPIC researcher, Nu Gao, to the stage. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here today and joining us both in person and online. I'm really excited about today's event. So this is joint work with my colleagues Hans Johnson and Julian LaFortune and PPIC, and also Anthony Dalton and the Ed Results <coughs> Partnership. And Courtney Lee, who's also with us here today, provided excellent research support. We also thank our funders, the, the Sutton Family Fund, for their uh, financial support. 
The K-16 policy landscape is changing and changing really fast. Both UC and CSU are considering changes to their admission requirements. For instance, UC is studying a proposal to increase the science requirements from two to three years. It is also studying the role of standardized testing, such as SAT or ACT, in the admission process. At the same time, CSU is investigating a proposal to include additional year of quantitative reasoning into its admission requirements. These proposals could really affect student outcomes because those policy, those eligibility policies directly affect how many and which students have access to college. And because of the inequitable distribution of education resources and also opportunities both within and outside of schools, those policies could have really significant policy equity implications. So for today's event, we'll be focusing on UC eligibility. In my presentation, I will walk you through some of the proposed changes to the science requirements. And in our panel discussion, we'll be broadening it up to talk about some other requirements as well. As I've mentioned, UC is currently considering a proposal to increase the science, also known as Area D requirements, from two to three years. It maintains the current requirements, which ask students to complete two lab sciences in three subjects of biology, chemistry, and physics, but it adds a third year science requirements. UC also recently included more courses, more science courses, than could be used to satisfy the third year science. And this proposal was in response to the new science standards adopted in K-12 schools. And the new science standards are called the Next Generation Science Standards, or NGSS. NGSS introduced two notable changes in high school. So first, it included a much broader definition of science disciplines, such as earth and space sciences. Second, it also introduced a different set of courses. For instance, some students could take integrated sciences in high schools. Those discipline and those courses were not accounted for in the, by the current area D requirements. The proposal could really, uh, the proposal could improve students' readiness for college by supporting NGSS implementation. But at the same time, it could affect students' eligibility, particularly among disadvantaged and underrepresented students. So in this report, we asked three very important policy questions. First, how many and which students might be affected by the proposal? Second, are high schools prepared to implement those changes? And third, what are the policy solutions both at the state and at the local levels to help those students meet the new requirements and also to mitigate some of those negative effects? To answer those questions, we use data primarily from the transcript evaluation services. We also conduct interviews with educators across the state. So let's start with the first question, how many and which students might be affected by the new requirements? In this figure, what we're showing is the share of A2G graduates that have completed only two years of Area D, or the science. And if, if nothing else changes, then these students could be potentially affected because they wouldn't be able to meet the new requirements. And overall, the number is 19%, so about one in five A2G graduates. But there are very important racial disparities. For instance, among white and Asian American students, their share is about 10% or so, but the number almost doubled among Latino and African American students. So given the scale of the problem, what happened and how can we really help those students meet those new requirements? Well, it turns out a lot of those affected students, they took the wrong science course. To see this, let's take a deeper look and their course transcripts in ninth grade. So in ninth grade, the vast majority of affected students, nearly 80% of those affected students, instead of taking the area D science, they actually took an UC approved elective. These are called area G. So among, the number is a lot lower, only 25% among non-affected students. So instead of taking area D science, they took an area G electives. You might wonder, what are those electives? Well, it turns out the vast majority of those electives were science course. So for instance, nearly 90% of those electives are, are science courses. And, speak, and in terms of specific science course, earth science, the single course accounted for about 45% 
of all of those electives. So these students, they took the wrong science courses. And given the scale of the problem, a very easy and simple policy recommendation is to change the course classification. So for instance, allowing those science electives to count as area D. This could really help those students meet the new requirements. So changing course classification could really help nearly half of those affected students. What about the other half? So when we look at those students, they have very similar academic preparations. So meaning that they have reasonably good, they have a reasonably good GPA. They also have very similar course taking patterns than those not affected students. But there are a number of institutional factors that really misplace or displace them into different into non-science courses. And in order to help those students, high schools need to take a set of actions. And and some of those actions are summarized in this slide here. So first, there's a lot of evidence, evidence suggesting that science course placement is not equitable, meaning that some of those criteria may be biased against underrepresented students. And in some high schools, there's not course placement policy at all. So second, high schools really need to improve or adjust the course scheduling. In many high schools, math turns out to be a gatekeeper to science course taking. So for instance, it's very, common for, it's very common for algebra two or equivalent to be the prerequisite for chemistry. So if a student fails an algebra two, then the student wouldn't be able to take chemistry. So third, for so many years, science has taken a back seat to math and English. So there's a lack of urgency among some administrators and even counselors. So eliciting stakeholder buy-ins will be really important to help those students. And fourth, California only requires two years of science for high school graduation. So this does not really give schools a lot of incentives to try to encourage students to take more science courses. And the last one is teacher staffing. We all know that California has a really serious teacher shortage, particularly in science. As one high school principal put it, right now, if everybody wants to take science course, I just don't have the spots. So this is a very nice segue into the next question. Are high schools prepared to implement those changes? Statewide, 9% of high schools did not offer enough area D or science courses. But most of, the, most of these non-offering high schools, they tend to be small schools. They also tend to be alternative schools or community centers. So after we account for these, when we look at the number of students that might be affected, what we found is about 2% of students, they were in a high school that did not offer enough science courses. But teacher staffing, as I've mentioned, presents a big challenge, especially in, in low-income schools. For instance, for nearly half of those high-need schools, at least one A to G area D course was being taught by an improperly certified teacher. And last, high school course offering does not guarantee students access to those courses. So the best evidence is all of the high schools in our data offered at least three science area D courses. But as you've seen, nearly 20% of those A to G graduates, they did not take three or more area D. So moving forward, implementing a very comprehensive course counseling, scheduling, and placement policy will be key to help those students succeed. I've touched on some of the policy recommendations throughout the presentation, but here is the summary of them. At the UC level, we think UC should further expand those area D to include more science electives. And if UC allows all science electives to count as area D completion, this could really benefit a lot of those underrepresented students. So for instance, it could actually reduce the Latino white gap by nearly half. Again, this is a very low cost policy because it does not require students to change their course taking behavior. And we also think, given the equity implications, we also think UC should consider a phase-in period and to monitor those equity issues before going full scale. And at this high school level, although UC could change the course classification, but the onerous is still on high schools to submit those courses into, into the right category. So effective in this school year, earth science could be used to count as area D completion. So high schools need to be aware of the policy change and also 
to consider submitting some of those eligible courses, such as earth, earth science into area D. So it's going to, so doing so will make it a lot easier for students to make, to meet the new requirements. And equally important, high schools need to review and if necessary, revise their course scheduling, counseling and placement policy. So students are being placed into the right science course. And at the state level, we all know that California has a really severe teacher shortage, particularly in science. So further investment to improve the science teacher workforce is going to be very, very important. In the governor's January budget proposal, he included nearly $900 million, and this is really encouraging. And last, we need a robust statewide longitudinal data system to improve the science to improve the science pathway because nearly less than a third of California students are proficient in science. And we need to address the pipeline issue. In order to do so, we have to start early. We also have to ensure students' success at every point in the process, but without the right data, but we can't do that without the right data. So this concludes my presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Julian, who will introduce our distinguished panel. All right, so thank you, New. Uh, again, I'm Julian LaFortune. I'm a research fellow and one of the co-authors on this report. And I'm pleased to be here, and thanks again for everyone for coming out here. I'm pleased to introduce our panel today. Um, on the left, we have Varsha Sarveshwar, the president of the University of California Student Association. In the, in the middle, we have Principal Blaine Watson, principal at Dominguez High School in the Compton Unified School District. And finally, Dr. Yvette Galat, the Vice Provost of Diversity and Engagement at the UC Office of the President. So again, I'd like to just thank the panelists for coming out here and sharing their expertise and helping us enrich this debate, um, which is obviously, as Deborah mentioned, something that's growing in importance or at least in policy focus. And so first, I'd like to start off by um, asking for some of the panelists' reactions to the report, and then we'll kind of pivot towards talking not just about science eligibility, <coughs> but more generally about, the, about the, all of the aspects of UC admission and UC eligibility to think about this problem more holistically. Um, but first, I'll start with you, Varsha. Uh, so what stood out, and we'll get to, you know, all of the panel, panelists will get to ask, answer this question. Is there anything that stood out about the findings of this report? Or from your perspective, what do you think about this proposal to increase the Area D science eligibility requirements? Sure. Um, well, thank you so much for, for having me and for, for taking into account students' perspectives and students' voices in this really important conversation. You know, when I was reading the report, the thing that stood out to me the most was that the, affected, the students who would be affected by the proposal and the students that would not are pretty similar in terms of their high school GPA, in terms of their course taking patterns. And the report pointed out that that suggests that there are a lot of institutional barriers for these students in taking these courses. I think that was that's really important because you know, when you're a high school student, you've got a lot going on and a lot of things you have to worry about, particularly if you're trying to apply to UC. And some of those institutional barriers, such as scheduling or maybe maybe not meeting all the prerequisites for a course, those can have really big impacts on, on students. They can all just be really overwhelming to, to deal with and to navigate. So I think before moving forward with a proposal like this, I think those really need to be taken into account. And Blaine, would you yeah. like to add anything? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's an honor to be here with uh, these amazing guests this morning um, and also to be a voice for our community in Compton Unified. Uh, the first thing that stood out to me was just the, the course taking options that are available with the new policy, how we can categorize courses um, under the D requirement, especially in schools um, that are offering a CTE pathway programs, um, or the career technical education programs. So for me, the first thing that, that, that um, was clear to me was that we have courses in engineering, we have courses in computer science that could be qualified as a D requirement and offer, um, you know, help close this gap for some of our students. Um, but obviously, the, the underlying thing that really stuck with me was how does, what does this policy look like potentially for the impact on students who are disadvantaged? Um, what does it look like in a community like mine in Compton? Um, how do we mitigate some of the challenges that we have around um, the DNF rates um, in courses, course options that start as early as ninth grade, math and English? Um, when you have more courses, obviously, um, you have to think about kids that, that need to remediation in earlier off in their, early on in their high school um, career. Um, so to me, that was really the challenge. And then really, just really, uh, we're, I know we're going to talk about it later on, but defining equity and how does this um, support 
um, a clear state's definition of equity, um, local definitions of equity, and how are we really looking to offer the best opportunities for our students and mostly students and students of color across the state of California. Thank you. And, and uh, before I begin, I want to thank the PPIC for undertaking this study with us. When we were reviewing the Area D proposal, um, we were familiar with work that PPIC had done on science in general in California. And so we approached you with, um, uh, to see if you were interested in taking a deep dive into one component of, of, of A through G to see what disparate impacts there might be. So first, thank you for um, joining with UC administration and UC faculty in conducting this study. One thing that stands out for me um, is the heavy lift that students have to take just to get to two, um, and that they start so late in the process, and that there's low-hanging fruit in ninth grade with respect to the wide array of science classes, earth sciences, that could be converted to make that an easier pathway for students. But uh, your emphasis on how much it would take for students just to move from to two classes from the one they take to get to three, I think was most compelling for us. Um, and that the racial and, et and ethnic disparities that we know to be true are real. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to something, Blaine, that you mentioned. So from your perspective, you mentioned uh, defining equity yeah. is something that's important. So from your perspective, and again, I'd like the other panelists to weigh into this on as well, how do you approach or, or define equity in this context when we're talking about UC eligibility and UC admissions? Well, the first thing I think about is how do you approach structures that, that are currently in place? How do you dismantle structures? How do you dismantle pedagogy? How do you dismantle um, systems that are, in place, uh, that are in place currently that challenge the opportunity for students who um, traditionally need more support? Um, how do we make sure that those, those systems, those structures are, are, are addressed in a way that students are at the center of the conversation? Um, what I did not see um, in the in the report and and in the conversation with other people was a conversation around how do we how do we conduct some type of opportunity impact assessment um, on the community um, and from UC uh, is UC looking at number one is UC thinking about the state's definition of equity as it's outlined in the LCFF um, which were all schools. Uh, LCFF is local control funding formula and the LCAP, which all school district, local education agencies are required to follow, right? So what does that look like for us? How does, how, what alignment is there in terms of equity defin defining between the school districts who are asked to follow the policy and put structures in place for students and UC's expectation for students to enter um, their, 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 their system? And so maybe a, a follow-up to that that, Yvette, you could provide some context on. So from the UC perspective, when we're considering changes to eligibility requirements, such as the Area D or even the SAT requirement, how does the UC incorporate the perspectives of these diverse sets of stakeholders from different levels of the community? Sure. Uh, you know, and certainly there, there, there has been over the last several years much consultation on this proposal. And I should be really clear, the university is maintaining status quo with respect to Area D. We are not making any changes to Area D. Um, and so it stands, at, you know, as it stands now in, in, in kind of stasis. Uh, I think for, for UC, when we're thinking about equity, we have, to, we have to follow our land grant mission, which is to ensure that every student in California has the opportunity to, to attend the university. So our faculty establish the college readiness standards um, for California, and that, that's, that's codified in the, in the A through G. But our land grant responsibility is to ensure that our students in California can meet that. And so when, when policy um, and institutional barriers are in, it, or, or require students to work around them or navigate them or be very, very sophisticated um, about how they, how they pursue access. And I think it's incumbent upon the university to look at what that impact is. Um, you know, equity demands data. And I think if, if, if anything, what this study um, shows and what I think the SAT ACT study represent are maybe perhaps a new way of approaching um, uh, uh, our, our policy making through an equity lens. Yeah. Taking a component of the process, 
looking at it very deeply through the data, and then determining whether a policy change creates a barrier for students that requires them to do way too much to overcome, to, to overcome it and achieve the access that they deserve. Thank you. So, Varsha, maybe we could get some, some input from the student perspective, given that you've recently gone through this process not too long ago. So, at least in your, you know, from your school, high school perspective, uh, how proactive was your school in ensuring that students were aware and prepared for these eligibility requirements? And are there types of supports that you think might help students navigate these processes more successfully? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, especially in the context of equity, because especially when you have complicated requirements for getting into the UC, I think it's important to realize that on the student's part, that takes intentionality, and it takes years of intentionality. You need to know years in advance of applying to college that this is something you want to do, that these are requirements you need to plan for, that you need to sort of think about how you're going to take all of your courses from ninth through 12th grade in order to meet all of the requirements, and then maybe exceed the requirements if you want to be a competitive applicant. And so high schools and even middle schools, I think, need to be working with students keeping that in mind. You know, there are students who, because of their background, because of who their parents are, they'll know what A through G requirements are when they're in middle school. They might even know about them even earlier than that. And there are students who will barely hear about them in high school, if ever. And so the more counseling supports there are, the better. In my school, I was, I was lucky to go to a pretty well-resourced high school. You know, we had mandatory counseling every single year. We would always be asked, you know, do you want to go to UC or do you want to go to these schools? OK, if you do want to go to these schools, here are the courses you're taking. Here are the A through G requirements you're not taking. When are you going to take them? Um, and those counseling supports were there every single year. They started in freshman year. Um, I think they started even like the, our first semester of freshman year. We had to have a mandatory meeting where we were talked through about those sorts of things. So we need to take that into account that this requires years and years and years of thinking and effort. And the earlier we can put it on students' radars, the better. Thank you. Uh, so Blaine, so from your perspective as a high school principal, what sort of challenges do you face in kind of providing this outreach and these supports for students? Right. Um, and, and, you know, while also navigating, I think, the difficulty that you're not only ensuring that students are prepared for UC, but that they're also college and career ready, and that you're preparing students more generally um, beyond just this one admissions criteria. So, so that's a real puzzle at the high school level is um, negotiating um, and be able to um, advise students on what is uh, the right path for them and then thinking about um, what course, and then again, let me back up a little bit, thinking about what we're held accountable to um, at the state level uh, because that's, there's, there's a huge conversation that I think is missing in terms of school accountability um, and what we're required to, um, to follow up with and what we're required to measure in terms of school success. Um, so at the California dashboard level, at the state level, every school and school district is, is accountable to a system of metrics, right? And at the California dashboard, one of the most important uh, metrics that we're looking at within um, where A through G lies is the California, or sorry, the um, college and career indicator. The college and career indicator has um, several metrics within it. You have A through G, you have what we call AB 288, which your college, your college courses that kids can take um, while they're taking um, high school coursework. Uh, we're talking about the career technical education um, courses that kids, kids can take when they c complete the pathway when they're in high school. Um, SBAC um, or, or CASP, CASP performance on, in math and English. So at the high school level, it's really challenging um, in terms of developing a program that really focuses on meeting the accountability need of the school, but also meeting the individual needs of the student. Um, and so we really have to have that conversation to talk about, okay, um, how do I get my kids ready for something that they potentially don't know they can be ready for, number one, right? Then how do I get my school ready for accountability metrics that sometimes feel um, that we cannot achieve, right? And so, um, you know, I really appreciate that Varsha went to a school potentially that was really well resourced. And I know that our high school, and where we have a, you know, we have a huge Title I population, 94% of our students live at or below the poverty level in California. Um, we have a, we're well resourced in terms of funding, right, uh, from the state and federal government, which I really appreciate. But money doesn't solve all problems. Right. And so you have to think about what is what does that look like in terms of creating a program where you're building um, self-efficacy in your student body to think about what is it that they really want. And I think self-efficacy is what she was talking about in terms of being able to create, um, generate a, a spirit in an individual to really think about what they want to accomplish and, and create a counseling team and an administrative team and teaching staff that can help guide that student along the right path. Um, and that's really the work. 
And that to me is the most challenging work. So when you have a student who is, you know, who comes in below grade level in math and English, um, and then you're thinking about more requirements, you know you have to put a child in potentially some coursework that would, that would increase their math and English capacity. And then you're thinking about more coursework that they have to take down the road. You know, how do you negotiate that? How do you, how do you really think about the best programming for your students? Um, and there's no answer, you know, honestly, Julian. The, the, the reality is we can create awareness on our campus. I think it starts with the adults. The, the, the adults need to know what the A through G requirements are. The adults need to understand what graduation requirements are. Adults need to understand what the accountability metrics are for the school. And then we work from that end to figure out how do we build capacity in our students to really understand how they can achieve and help us achieve um, um, you know, more better accountability at the state level. But mo most importantly, I'm not worried about state first. We're worried about our students and what they're going to do upon graduation. Um, you know, so it's really about thinking about each child as an individual, but really focusing on the school as a whole. And that's really a challenging piece as a, as, a, as a school leader and as a, as, a, as a member of the person of the school site. So, Ved, I'd like to pose this question first to you, but then invite the rest of the panelists to uh, chime in if they have any additional perspectives. And that's kind of thinking more generally, how should we balance or how should the system balance the importance of ensuring that students are adequately prepared for the rigor of the UC system, while at the same time ensuring that access for underrepresented groups isn't adversely affected, especially given the challenges that many students face in preparing for these standards. Sure. Uh, and so, Julian, I think in my answer, I want to I want to quote a, a colleague of mine who is the superintendent of Sacramento City Unified, Jorge Aguilar, who says that we want to prepare all students to have the widest variety of post-secondary options, yep. right? And I think, I think any time you're in a rationing situation, there are trade-offs. So I think as a university, we need to think more broadly about pathways um, to, to higher education. We need to streamline those pathways when possible. We need to provide different opportunities for students to be successful. One thing we know from the work that we do um, in our outreach programs and our educational partnerships programs is there's an incredible amount of talent in California schools that, that, that we don't get to capture in our public higher education for lack of a course, right? Or lack of, um, of, of, of strong advising. And these are, these are unacceptable for, for California. So I think that we have the most amazing public higher education system in, in the country, arguably the world. And to, I'd like to have the good problem of way too many students. Yeah. But I'd also want those students to have pathways to that education in whatever way, shape, or form it needs to take. And perhaps that includes thinking more broadly about what constitutes college readiness. And I think what we've been able to see is if, if so many students are in earth sciences, Let's move those courses out of, out of an elective and into Area D and work with our, our schools to build the academic rigor there. And our faculty um, have, have agreed to that, uh, which then solves this problem of getting on the pathway late, right? But I also think we need to understand more about what it means to make these kinds of changes. So for example, um, if students have an opportunity to expand the range of disciplines through which they are uh, thinking about science, um, thinking about scientific inquiry, practicing and experiment, experimenting and failing. Um, what effect does that have on additional science? How do we infuse that kind of rigor into every course a student, a student takes? How do we help schools understand courses that they have that, that many, many students are enrolled in that could be A through G approved with a few tweaks because one of the things that the data set that you use is able to show schools is where students are enrolled and what opportunities there are for some curricular changes to make sure that every student in a school has access to that rigorous curriculum. But I think it's a good problem to have California's talented students um, overrepresented right across all of the all of the institutions and um, ready for for their their futures and and getting baccalaureate degrees to meet our workforce needs but i think it starts with with this kind of study we have to understand the equity impacts of the decisions we make and this is a, this is a first step i think in that in that direction so I 
explain, or Varsha, do you have anything? Uh, yeah, to add? I, I yeah. thought about you know understanding the equity issues that we're really facing. So before we met this morning, I, I looked up uh, on on DataQuest and the California Department of Education website. I looked at our A through G completion rates for different subgroups or identified subgroups, and I found um, this past year, so at the end of the 18-19 school year, uh, just 24% of African-American males um, complete the A through G requirements across the state. 37% um, African-American females. Um, looking at Latino males, 28% Latino females, 43%. Um, English language learners, or what we like to call it my site, um, emerging bilinguals, 14% of emerging bilingual males completed the A through G requirements, and just 22.5% of the English emerging bilingual females. And then looking at other disadvantaged groups, foster youth across the state, only 11%, and then um, homeless youth, 20%. So if our goal is to think through an equity lens and offer uh, more robust and rigorous and college-ready coursework to our students, the question is, what does it look, for, look like for these populations? How do we get, and I understand just a quick and easy fix, you know, resubmitting our, mm -hmm. our, you know, our, our ninth grade environmental or earth science uh, requirement, moving it from, um, uh, moving it to, from, yeah, from, from uh, G to D. Yes, that's one solution. Um, however, though these populations, what we're seeing is that they're disproportionately failing math and English. Disproportionately, disproportionately failing other science classes. And so we spend a, an awful lot of time trying to remediate and, and we're working and through, and I think one of the larger conversations that needs to happen is what, are, what do intervention systems look like at the local level? And how do intervention systems work to support kids moving toward A through G? Um, it's, it's a really difficult, and I don't have solutions today. I mean, you know, I'm just really kind of posing some questions because these are conversations that when more heads come together and think through, there can be some potential solutions. Um, but the data to me is scary um, when we're thinking about increasing coursework. A lot of people would say, hey, you know, it's easy just to increase accountability, right, uh, for adults and have high and clear expectations for all of our students and for our adults not to fail students. Um, but in practice, it's not that easy. And so we need to think about how do we build capacity and some of the teachers that teach these, these high impact courses um, to have more relational capacity because a lot of kids fail. You know, oftentimes we've done surveys and we've seen research where kids don't go to class or do perform well in class because they like the content, it's because of the teacher. And so we have to think about how we think about relationships um, and content together and reminding and building capacity in teachers to think about your responsibility to teach the child before you teach the content. And it has to do with your heart first. Um, you know, and a lot of people may not agree, agree with that, but that is the reality, especially in the communities that we're, that we're working in, where I'm seeing um, these disproportionate numbers. So, you know, I just want to remind us that um, our teachers are going to need, in this initiative, there, have to, there has to be, and also with CSU moving to four years, we have to think about um, what it looks like in terms of building capacity in teachers to teach from the heart and think about grading practices and pedagogical practices that would support um, keeping kids keeping kids in the class, keep them connected to the, to the teacher and keep them connected to the content and closing gaps that we know are going to traditionally keep our kids behind. Yeah, it's interesting as I was as hearing these responses, I'm, I'm kind of wondering how much of college readiness is like a matter of belonging, right? Because, you know, as a, as a student, it's hard for me to remember what I learned in high school, right? I, I pretty much remember nothing. Um, I mean, to be honest, right? <laughs> you know, and, but, but what I, what you learn from high school is to learn to be a student, right? To have a lot of initiative, to know that you, you know, you deserve to go ask your teacher a question after yeah. school if you don't understand something, right? That you deserve those educational opportunities in high school and in college. And I think where a lot of students struggle is this idea of imposter syndrome, right? I don't belong, I don't deserve to be here, which is of course worsened by I don't see anyone here who looks like me. I don't see anyone teaching here who looks like me. And of course that's you know disproportionately impacting black and brown students. So if you know if we're gonna have requirements that are 
harder for these students to overcome, that's going to make these students feel like things are unfair. And then they're going to go to campuses where they don't see that many people who look like them, who, you know, people who are teaching them who look like them. I wonder how much we're, you know, we may be unintentionally making it harder for these students to kind of claim their education. And then how much does that factor into these students' willingness to take initiative in their own education? Because, you know, and so that's sort of my, it's the, to me, the thing that I think made me ready for college was the belief that I deserved to put in every bit of effort I had into my education. And, you know, we know just from seeing our classrooms that not all of our students feel that way and they struggle a lot with that. So I think that it's a, it's a harder thing to measure, but I think that that does need to be a part of the conversation. If I could add, it, it, to, to your point, Blaine, it was really interesting to see in the data the number of D's and F's that students received um, and the impact that that had on their, their progression. And I think there's very little, there, there's much more we need to understand about belonging, about, about teacher practice, um, to, to really inform what we do in schools. And I think we're, we're trying to make policy decisions or policy changes or have policy conversations without centering that student experience right in the middle of it. So given these challenges, these beliefs, these disproportionalities, I guess, um, Yvette, I'll start with you. Do you think then that top-down reform is an appropriate or effective means um, for which we can promote improved <laughs> college access and readiness? Um, I don't. I, I don't think. mean to put you on the spot by this. But <laughs> no, no. It kind of um, just it teed up nicely. Yeah, so. I think. <laughs> I, I think that there has to be uh, much more partnership. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I do think that, that we want students to come to the university very, you know, very prepared. But I, I like to remind people that, you know, the university was, was made great on the backs of a whole bunch of B students. Um, and so we need, to, we need to be mindful that students bring a lot of assets to them. There are lots of ways that they can, they can demonstrate their talent. Um, and, and what they can contribute to university. And we need to be open and, and, and weigh those things um, in, in, in ways that reflect the, the true demography, the demography of California. Um, so, you know, we need to consult and, I, and we need to use data and we need to get the feedback and we need to hear from all of the stakeholders. And I think that this, this particular kind of policy and the way that, that your, your research move forward on that gives us that kind of insight to say, well, let's take a step back before we implement something that, while we think it's a great thing, we want students to have more science, right? I think you understand Emerson a lot better when you, when you approach it from a scientific lens. But that doesn't mean the only way to do it is to say, well, if we want more, now, clearly, half of the students in California aren't achieving A through G now. And we've had an A through G curriculum for 50 years. Maybe not that long, 50 years. So just having it, it's not a build it and they will come scenario when it comes to, to these requirements. We need to really understand ground up um, how these things actually function, how they operate, how they ration, how they displace, and then build policies that reflect those, those, those disparities and mitigate them from the outset. And so Blaine, from your perspective yeah. as a high school principal, are there types of cooperation or collaboration with the UC and even the CSU system that you think would be helpful to try and achieve these type of, you know, this cross-cutting collaboration that could help students? Absolutely. I, I mentioned it earlier, I think that um, I was calling on a, uh, some research around um, what, what uh, the, was it, the, uh, was it, the organization is called the Poverty and Race Research Action Council, I think they're out of DC, they have a, they have a process um, called an, uh, an opportunity, imp opportunity Impact Statement um, or Opportunity Impact Assessment. And from what I've read about this type of protocol, you would actually engage the community and look for all of the potential adverse effects that a new policy would have on the community. And that would engage, that would then, um, you could take a sample size of schools, do focus grouping, um, you know, of, of different stakeholders within the community to really pull, pull some real qualitative information, because quantitative is great. We look at numbers all the time, but they don't inform us as much as, that data does inform us as much as people can inform us in conversation about some real ideas that can help support the policy. Because I, I, I agree with you, but I think everybody wants to move, um, wants to prepare our kids. It's built into our mission statement. We want to build 21st, uh, 21st century opportunities for our students. However, um, 
you know, policies don't work well unless they're built in collaboration with people that they're affecting. And so we have to think about what that looks like at the local level. Um, and I don't know how UC does that with, you know, county offices of education. You know, in, in Los Angeles, we have the Los Angeles County Office of Education and potentially we could, there's an office or a group of people who can come out to the site and do some work with us to collect some more input, input on what that looks like in, in terms of implementation then provide some strategies for us um, in terms of looking at what other districts are doing across um, our region um, to potentially build um, some effective practice um, practices to support us in transition. Um, but that would have to happen almost immediately because this is something that could be coming right around the corner. So um, that's what I would suggest. I definitely think a partnership like that, I think UC may not have the capacity to work with the entire state yeah. and all high, <laughs> high schools across the across the, the, the state of California. However, um, you know, the state could work with local education agencies to make sure that happens. That communication and that collaboration is very much effectively done effectively well. And so one particular aspect of this that's received some legislative interest, as Deborah mentioned earlier, is that UC and CSU could or should have the same coursework required for admission. So I guess, Varsha, I'll, I'll pose this question to you first. But given that this hasn't always been the case historically, but the criteria have been roughly similar for several years now, do you think that that is something we should try to maintain, that UC and CSU have the same coursework requirements? Yeah, I think so. When you make things easier for high school students to understand, you're sort of reducing the burden on them in terms of what they need to navigate. You make it easier for them to have more options. They can sort of do the same thing and they don't feel like they need to decide early on what they do and don't want to do. Um, I believe they were the same when I was applying for college and, and I know that that is probably, that's something that, you know, when I was a high school, you didn't have to worry about that, right? If you were eligible, you were eligible and it was done. And I think that that's, you know, the simpler it is for our students, the better. Did you have something? Sure, I mean, I, I, I do remember the days <laughs> when they were different, and, and um, I'll, I'll share a, a personal story with you. When I was uh, in high school, I took um, the UC A through G curriculum. I have a younger sister. She went to a different school than me, and the counselor gave my mother a different set of courses to take, and my mother was perplexed. She said, but these aren't the courses Yvette took. And he says, well, uh, we're preparing Delina for a CSU. And my, sister, my mother said, well, why, why would we prepare Delina differently than we would prepare Yvette? It's like, well, she's, she's, she's um, CSU bound, right? Um, which was true, she did really well. But I think, I think this idea of this pre-sorting of students um, is, is problematic. And I think we, if we were student-centered, if we were student-centered, we would have the same for all, known for all, known to all, the same for all because students should have the widest variety of options. And so sorting them too early, um, I think, uh, undermines that. And so this, this kind of moving on the, same, on the same path works well for schools, it works well for students, and it works well for families. I agree. Um, so just kind of building on this and broadening this conversation a bit more generally, uh, so given that eligibility levels, at least in terms of the coursework that's required, or the, sorry, the percent of students um, that are eligible for UC in the CSU systems has stayed roughly similar over the years, but we've seen a large increase in the share of students who are prepared through their A through G completion. Um, there's a documented need through many sources, PPIC included, for more highly educated students and highly educated workers in today's 21st century economy. So should UC and maybe the CSU system as well think about making more students eligible or expanding access given that there are more and more students each year that are hi highly prepared and adequately prepared, um, but may not have the opportunity or a slot available for them. And so I invite any of the panelists to address this question. Are you talking about, in, are you asking about enrollment, increasing enrollment, or? It could be increasing, in, I guess, yes, increasing enrollment. So we have more students than ever who are prepared mm -hmm. to enroll in the UC. Um, we have a need for highly educated workers in our workforce. Um, should we, is this a conversation we should be having about how do we expand access and kind of up this percentage to a higher share than it is currently? Now, Varsha and I were talking about this a little earlier about, about enrollment with, with some caveats. So perhaps she'll, she'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, we as students are definitely supportive of making sure that a UC is not selective or, you know, becomes this elite institution, right? We don't want that. 
Um, we do want to make sure, though, that you know when we're enrolling students, we're giving them the same high quality education that generations previous, you know, previously received. So the same levels of support services, the same you know faculty to staff, uh, faculty to student ratios, and that we're not sort of um, making those worse just so that we could have more students. Right? We want everyone to be supported, supported through their education. You know, I think this kind of came up in the SAT task force report where there was something about thinking about expanding system wide eligibility sort of beyond. Um, high school GPA and SAT. I think that makes a lot of sense. As, as Yvette said earlier, I think you know Yvette made, Yvette made a comment about um, you know it's not a problem if we have more students who are eligible. It's not a problem if we have more students from underrepresented communities who are eligible. And as long as there are disparities in who are eligible and who's not, I don't think it's a problem for us to to be thinking about expanding that. For me, it, it takes me back to the definition of equity we were talking about earlier, and um, you know to quote um, uh, Dr. Pedro Noguera. Um, out of UCLA currently, you know, he's talked about the pursuit of equity is when you give students who are in, in high need, right, you provide them with what they need to succeed. And if the definition of success is for them to enter UC um, or CSU, what does that look like for them individually? What does that look like for them in terms of that subgroup or that population in that community, um, which could look different for that and actually look different for the same ethnic group in a different in a different region within the same state. Um, so you know there we need to really put on this a larger equity lens and think about what this looks like um, if we're talking about expanding admission requirements um, to make sure that not you know they're a, a larger mix of quantitative and qualitative um, assessment um, approaches. That's what we have to do to think about what, what it looks like. But at the end of the day, we want more kids to have access um, to rigorous coursework. We want more kids to have access to college eligibility. We want more kids to have access to graduating from universities in our state so that we can continue to grow our economy. Um, you know, but also let's not forget the conversation about trade school because our economy will also grow when our kids are, are going to, to trade school. And, and, you know, there are a lot of kids who have, they've woken up one day and said, you know what, you know, UC or CSU is not for me. I can make better or more money and have better benefits, right, and potentially retire earlier if I pursue um, this career doing that, right? There's, and, and there's nothing wrong with that conversation. But we need to think about what it means to prepare a student to have that conversation with themselves and also with their family. Um, so we have to be equipped at the school site. We have to be equipped at the universities to be able to guide our youth um, to making the right decisions for their life. And if I can sort of jump in on that too, you know, if we're going to be enrolling more students from underrepresented communities at UC, I think we need to require that that requires more resources, and not just per student, right? It needs more resources per student. Um, that those students are going to have more of a need for counseling services. They're going to have more of a need for mental health services, culturally competent mental health services. Right? They're going to have, you know, they're going to need more individualized teaching. If they want to see their professor, they need to be able to do it, and so. Those sorts of those specialized resources are very, very important. If we simply enroll these students and aren't conscious of the fact that those additional resources are necessary, we're going to just going to worsen those, you know, those issues with imposter syndrome and, and worsen those equity gaps, and that'll play out in our graduation rates and, and who's making it through and how long it's taking them to. So that's one thing that we're always advocating for is those specialized resources for students who don't have these advantages that their classmates do. Yeah. Well said. And so, Yvette, are there programs at the UC that currently help these underrepresented students, especially first generation students that may not have the same knowledge and family experience navigating, you know, not just the eligibility, but the admissions, but also the college experience itself? Thanks. Yes. So, so Blaine said earlier, you know, there's no way the university can, you know, do this in every school in the state. We certainly have tried. <laughs> uh, we serve about 1,500 schools. So first, the university has a relationship with every school th in the state through the course articulation process, right, through the A through G approval process. Um, but second, on top of that, we actually provide a number of, of outreach programs, direct services to schools to provide college advising, academic enrichment, college knowledge for parent, parents, students, and, 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 and other members of their families. Um, every campus has educational partnerships yeah. with their local, with their with schools in their local regions in order to close opportunity gaps um, and help advance schools and districts on, on, on these pathways. Uh, we are the state, uh, we administer on behalf of the state the California Gear Up program, which yeah. does exactly what you talked about, works with the adults in schools mm -hmm. about their knowledge, their knowledge and their beliefs and their practices, um, beginning with, with middle school students. Um, we've also 
in 2018, uh, launched 45 new online courses um, so that students have other ways of taking um, um, A through G advanced placement and honors courses that are A through G approved um, and through a variety of mechanisms, whether it's on demand or whether it's taught through, uh, um, through a school to, to, to supplement and enhance and in some cases um, provide in addition to or uh, uh, what's available at a school site. Uh, to, the, to the question about trade, we know that a lot of students, you know, they see this as either or. And so we've built courses that meet both, that are career technical as well as A through G approved, things like green building design, um, where students can, can, and can, can do both things um, and achieve both, um, both certifications. Uh, so I think, I think the university does, does a lot, uh, but we can't get everywhere. We'd like to. We'd like to, we'd like to help schools with, their, with this low-hanging fruit. We want to help schools with, with building college cultures, um, expanding college knowledge, um, helping more adults in schools understand the pathways. Um, we also have responsibility for educator preparation. And when I think about the question about science, I think about the, the chronic shortage of science teachers, which your, which your survey, which your study points out, as well as your experience being a principal. And so the university has a role to play in teacher education and teacher professional development. Um, so I, I'm particularly proud of an effort on our campuses which takes our undergraduates who are math and science majors and provides them with teaching um, while they're as un undergraduates in preparation for getting a teaching credential. And I'd like to see us do more of that um, in more places across the state. And then, of course, there are the science and math projects, the California subject matter projects that we administer um, intersegmentally that are you know, making a difference in terms of how teachers are prepared, right? what, they, what they know and are able to do, and creating a community of teachers for, for, for the betterment of science education um, across, across the state. So there's a lot the university does. There's a lot, it's a drop in the bucket to the need. Um, and so we'd like to close that gap so that we're helping more schools. And when, when issues like this come up, it, sim it points to how urgent and how important it is that the university partner with its schools in order to make these, this access and opportunity available. The, the really cool thing to, 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 to on that point is that students are doing this work too. That's so right. the university has um, a whole range of pro uh, programs that are focusing on outreach, recruitment, and retention. And one of those programs are called Student Initi Initiated Outreach Programs. And those are student-run centers on our campuses that are going to you know different you know, just local schools and talking to students about how they need to apply, you know, how they can apply to UC. Um, those students sometimes I know at Berkeley they bring admitted students to campus, and it's called like Senior Weekend, and those students can meet students who look like them and have mm. backgrounds like them. Um, and those programs are really successful at getting those students to ultimately commit. So the really awesome thing is that students are recognizing the need for this work and they're doing it. I mean, at UC Berkeley, our students actually passed a fee on themselves in order to fund these programs, a very significant fee. Um, so you know, to, this, to the small extent that we can, students are, are participating in that conversation. Oh, can I add to that? Yeah. The, the thing the students do that's unique is that they reach students the professional staff can't reach. Yeah. They reach students who have who are foster youth and system incarcer system impacted, um, who've never thought about college that professional staff just can't get to. So what they do, their contribution to this work is significant and it's impactful on students who would not otherwise be thinking about or planning for college. I will say, quick anecdote, this week, um, I think it was Wednesday, we had a Coffee with the Principal event. Um, I host a monthly Coffee with the Principal with the parents. And this this month, we were doing uh, campus walkthroughs in classrooms. We were visiting classrooms with uh, with about maybe 35 parents, right, different classrooms. And out of, down the hallway, I saw one of my um, uh, graduates from last year, Isai Galindo. Oh, give him a quick plug. Um, Isai is a UC student now. He's at UC Santa Clara. Um, and he showed up on campus. He had two other UC students with him. And he said, hey, you know, Mr. Watson, we're here recruiting students to, to come to UC. And um, that's a perfect example of student-led. And I asked him, what is this about? I had no idea. You know, this is like a military recruiting on campus <laughs> uh, for UC. And I was, you know, and I, I, was, it, I, was, I was extremely impressed. 
um, because they stopped and they actually took over the pa the parent meeting. Uh, I was stopping, I was debriefing the classroom officer, uh, just like, you know, looking at the classroom with parents and I was talking to parents about what we were learning and they said, you know, sorry, we don't want, we want to take over your parent meeting real quickly. And they talked to parents about what they were doing. And number one, I was pre I'm really highly impressed and I was really, I felt really proud that one of my former students was talking so passionately um, to parents about, you know, his experience at Dominguez High School and his journey into UC. And then talking about his strategy with two other colleagues from UC about recruiting students at Dominguez High School. So um, I would like, I love to see more of that. Um, you know, more students that they can come every day. You know, <laughs> hang out at lunch. You have a table set up and talk to kids. I think that influence, that peer influence, and having those positive, that positive um, peer pressure, those role models come on campus often is going to be. It can be a game changer, right? We can really see kids see themselves in other people who've matriculated from our high school into college and, and aspire to do the same thing or better. Great, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to turn it to questions from the audience. Yeah. I guess we'll wait one moment for the microphone. But I'd like to thanks again to the panelists. That was a very lively and engaging and very informative conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank you once more. Thank you, uh, Jake Brenner, with the Campaign for College <laughs> Opportunity. And thank you, PPAC, for um, bringing this conversation to Sacramento and, and conducting such a thoughtful review um, of the implications for this kind of admissions change. We hope that all of our uh, university partners will do similar assessments of what their admissions change proposals look like. Um, but my question is actually around what access to A to G curriculum looks like at high schools that are listed um, in the state um, data sets as offering the full a to G pathway, yeah. um, but particularly um, at our under-resourced schools, what we hear is very often, you know, we talk about impaction at the, the CSU or at the UC, but these same courses that are necessary to just be eligible to apply can be impacted for a student who's at the high school. So um, certainly we need to focus on those high schools that don't even offer A to, all of the A to G courses yet, but could any of you maybe speak to um, if you've looked at in the research or or in your own practice, yeah. um, what happens at these high schools where you know maybe there's just that one teacher who's offering uh, physics to their students, and and what are we going to do to make sure that you might be listed as offering A to G, but can students really access it or not? Yeah, you know the the data aren't sensitive enough to that um, sort of local condition, but but we do know that you know. Course availability is pretty robust in California schools. And I think what New pointed out in the survey is that only 2% when you adjust for um, uh, school settings, only 2% of schools don't have RED and you, or three years of RED. So you can surise from that that the majority of schools have um, um, uh, courses um, that are available. But what availability means looks different in every place. and, and um, Blaine spoke to this about, you know, I may only have a teacher who teaches, you know, there's one section of physics, right? So that if there's one section of physics, that's 30 students in a 1,500 school environment who have access at any given time to physics, right? Yeah. So the, the data aren't sensitive enough to that, but we can infer by looking at where's, what courses students are taking. Um, what availability looks like, and then, but we can also see what opportunity, what availability opportunities there there might be. But there's there's you know you have to have the teachers, you have to have um, you know qualified um, teachers, and you have to have enough sections, which is something we can't quite tease out. That's a great point. You know, talking about the sections of, in, of, of particular courses. Um, you know, for example, we have at Dominguez High School, we have. Um, 1,800 students on campus, so, and then we have a continuation, co-located continuation programs, about 2,400 kids total, about 2,300 kids total on campus. Um, the, the actual uh, number of kids taking physics, like you said, is just kind of limited to one teacher, right? And so, and that one teacher teaches both physics and mathematics. And so we're talking about, I think she has two sections of, of physics, um, but I am really proud. I mean, our, our district is doing tremendous work, you know, incredible leadership, from the board of trustees and our and our superintendent and our director of count directors of counseling, um, you know, last year Dominguez High School we are at forty seven percent A through G completion rate. Um, you know, last year one of our other high schools fifty percent of the students in, in at Centennial High School, right? And so we're really proud of the work we've done to close the A through G gap for our students. The question, however, end, ends up being 
when students fail, mm -hmm. you know, other courses, what, you know, what is the, what is the priority in terms of their courses um, moving forward? Um, are, are, does it shift from A through G completion to just graduation, right? And so that's, that's the real, um, that's the real issue to mitigate is how do we reduce the number of D's and F's so kids have more course offerings and kids find high school to be fun, right? Because it's more fun when you're taking more courses that you really want to take and you want to learn. Learning, learning becomes fun when you have choice in your course offering. Learning is, is less fun when you're stuck to taking classes that you took already in your, first, in your first year in high school, right? And so that's the real challenge. How do we get kids to um, not fail early in high school? Um, and how, then if we have, if we set that type of culture, then we can offer more courses, more A through G courses, more elective courses, potentially that kids will be really inspired to take, especially in the sciences. Yeah, I would add too that um, prerequisites are definitely an important thing to look at. My high school had prerequisites for you know, most of the lab science courses and, you know, you couldn't get into an honors or AP course if you, you know, got this grade in algebra two or something like that. And then that kind of creates this weird inequity because, you know, then some students could appeal. You had students with, you know, more involved parents who would get involved in these kinds of conversations and students who maybe just thought, okay, I guess that's it. I can't take this class. You know, they didn't. And so um, making sure that we're not creating barriers to these courses somewhere else is, I think, also really important. Yeah. I I think credit recovery is an under understood component of A through G completion. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think merits much more um, research because it is it is impacting progress significantly, particularly for for African American and Latinx students. Any other questions? Um, I may be wrong, but I thought that earth science was taken in high school by students who were pretty much not planning on going to college. And I'm wondering if you kick it up a notch to make it an A through G, um, what's going to happen to those poor students who are just taking their science to graduate? So just to understand the question, you're, you understood that earth science was, a, was, a, was an elective course potential that kids were just taking who were not on the college track to graduate? Uh, that was my understanding. Okay. Well, I, I would argue that uh, in ninth grade, um, we don't know if kids are on a college track or not yet. So um, offering an environmental science or earth, earth science, shift, I like the idea of shifting it from, you know, from, the, from the G to the D requirement is going to be the, a, a very effective um, first move, one of the first moves we can make. Um, but I think that when we have kids taking science that is going to satisfy their uh, in ninth grade, satisfying requirement toward graduation and then ultimately toward the A through G completion, it's just a, it's just another piece of the puzzle, right? Um, but no, I don't I don't believe that students taking environmental science or earth science in freshman year are are not on a on a graduation track. I mean, there's no way to to be able to negotiate that conversation with a student in ninth grade. Um, you'll I think all kids in ninth grade we want to put them on an A through G track. That's the goal. We want to make sure all kids have access to college as early as possible. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, that's from my from my perspective. Like, um, it just seems like, from my experience, that kids are um, who are really low academically and don't seem to have the capability. Right. You know, are uh, are it suggested that they take earth science instead of you know other science classes like a biology potentially or physics their freshman year. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I think I think um, the the. The philosophy potentially in, in, uh, in enrolling a student in, in earth science in freshman year is just satisfying the elective requirement early enough um, as a G requirement um, to, to, to just check it off the list so we can satisfy the other requirements uh, later on in their, in their um, high school career. Uh, so if I can add on to that, so I think in some high school, very limited, it's not very widespread. So some schools, um, in some schools, the their science sequence will start with earth science. So there might be some cases, but it's not very widespread. And also NGSS, the new the next generation science standards are trying to change that. So earth science, you know, the 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 level of rigor is really high, and uh, so um, earth science will not be considered as for students who are not college bound. So the problem is not very widespread across the state. Yeah.
Has there been any consideration of how that might impact like CTE course uh, taking behavior? If that's scatter, like if it's a science course that's categorized as G? Um, absolutely. Um, if you if you if if you're if you're having a student take um, this uh, G requirement in their freshman year and they're not enrolled in a CT class or freshman year, it's going to affect. It depends on if you pat the pathway. The CT pathway is two or three years, right? Um, typically, you want to get a kid into the into the CT pathway as early as possible. You don't want to wait until their sophomore year to enroll them in the in the pathway. So yeah, it could have it could have some adverse effect. On, on a student's um, uh, completion of a pathway if you put them in, a, in an earth science in freshman year. So this isn't directly related to high school, but um, I'm not teaching now, but I taught sixth grade um, very recently in two different school districts. And the other sixth grade teachers um, either didn't teach science at all or didn't teach it until after they, the students took their state test. So there's a real problem, and these were both you know, um, lower socioeconomic schools, and that's just a huge problem, I think. Hi, Elizabeth Schmidt with Assemblymember Mark Berman's office. I'm curious specifically about barriers to categorizing, categorizing computer science classes in Area D, um, specifically um, AP computer science, and also given the fact that in California it's math teachers that are generally qualified to teach computer science. I believe one of, one of the recommendations in the, in the report was to reconsider who can teach uh, computer science, and I think that's a, a, a thing that ought, we ought to um, take under serious consideration to expand um, uh, the opportunity for computer science instruction. And you know, we're, we're looking forward to creating um, a new subject matter project in computer science that can provide the kinds of supports for, for teachers who currently teach or who want to teach in that discipline. Um, at, at the local level, uh, in my high school, we have a computer science pathway. Um, so I'm excited about the opportunity to classify that course as a, as a D requirement. Um, and then obviously, the, the, the current teacher I have in the program uh, is an industry certified teacher. So the teacher has been working computer science for how long he's been working um, in the industry before he came to teach. Um, but math, he, gets, he has a math degree, all right, so, but doesn't necessarily have the math credential, right? And so um, that's something to consider is what, what additional um, certification would we then require if that, that, just a conversation to have, would there be additional require, a requirement for a teacher who doesn't have a math credential who is already a computer science teacher, who is being recruited to become a computer science teacher. But I will, I will say that would make it much more difficult because it's really challenging to find teachers um, to teach CTU courses um, because you're looking often for somebody who has the industry expertise, um, who's left the career to come and teach it um, at the school site. Um, so that's, um, that's just obviously a conversation we're going to have to have down the road. But um, like I said, I'm excited about the opportunity to qualify that course and the courses in that pathway as a D requirement. All right, so we're nearing the end of our time, but we'll take these two final questions. So, so this is sort of going back to being student-centered. Um, a lot of the conversation today, of course, has been about the A through G requirements and the public university <laughs> system here in California. I'm just curious to know if there is any thought about any potential ramifications of changing any requirements or changing coursework for those students who maybe aren't looking to the public universities or are looking out of state? Not that I, not to my knowledge. It could be no. Yeah, could be no, okay. <laughs> I would say not to, not to my knowledge. I know that many of our private and independent <laughs> colleges and universities rely on, on A through G um, to serve as their indicators of college readiness as well. Hello, thank you very much for very interesting uh, presentations and this 
panel. Uh, my name is Simei Ling Hamilton. I'm an environmental geochemist and educator teaching at college university level. I wanted to thank you, sir, uh, Lane, for being excited about earth science. I teach geology, mm -hmm. chemistry, and earth science. Yeah. And I find that a lot of people uh, misunderstand what earth science is right. all about. Right. I would have students in my courses taking them because they didn't want to take chemistry or physics. Right. And I would say, surprise. <laughs> it is because chemistry, uh, Earth science is actually chemistry, <laughs> physics, biology, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and geology. Absolutely. So I am very excited, and I do hope that we move forward in putting Earth science into the D category so that I can get more students to torture at the college <laughs> and university level. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I think that just about wraps up our time. I'd like to thank everyone again for coming and especially thank the panelists for sharing their opinions. So.